I'm from the island of Puerto Rico. Lately in the news and local media, the hottest subject is the mental health of the Puerto Rican people. This arises because professionals attribute the ailments of our society, crime, rape, murder, and recently the amount of pedophilia to our low standards on the subject of mental health. So the government's solution has been to spend millions of dollars, even with the island's non-existent economy, putting it into public mental health services. So far to my knowledge, the funds have gone to mental health institutes and hospitals, and the medication is also being paid for. Are mental health issues the cause of the problems in Puerto Rico? That's from Dante. No! <laughs> hey Dante, how you doing? I'm pretty good, you? I'm well, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a resounding no, but um, what's, uh, I haven't heard much about the pedophilia in uh, Puerto Rico. What's going on with that? Uh, yeah, well, that's been recently in the past, like, uh, three months. Um, honestly, I think it's just another excuse to get more funding. Uh, and I, I think it worked. It did work. But, uh, yeah, it's been a really worrisome, the amount of pedophilia that's been going on in the news. And, uh, um, I've met some victims myself and, uh, I, sadly I was, uh, I've been committed several times to, uh, mental hospitals and uh, there, I, I got to meet some of them and hear their stories out and how uh, it seems to happen a lot from my understanding. Do you, um, I mean, were the stories the usual horror shows that you'd expect of, uh, you know, relatives or friends or something like that, um, raping or molesting children? Yeah, usually, you know, the, the loving grandfather, the eccentric uncle, uh, the stepfather, uh, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, do you know if the new pedophilia thing is more reporting of it or do you think that the prevalence is increasing? And I understand that's a really tough question because, you know, you may not have the data, neither do I, but, uh, just in your, in your opinion. Uh, well, from what I read, uh, I didn't read too much into it, but from what I read from the news article, I didn't go into more specific statistics, but apparently it has increased in just uh, what's been going on in 2016. It's increased uh, uh, 17% the amount of reporting. Right. And that means either of the increase, like the rate of reporting is the same and it's gone up or the rate of reporting has gone up. But uh, Yeah. But it, right. Uh, the only thing I'm worried about is just the amount of reporting has increased. It's a, it's been nonstop for the past. Uh, I'm gonna go since February. It's been nonstop uh, on uh, newspapers, you know, just the uh, local media. I'm gonna assume that it's mostly male perpetrators who are being reported. Oh no! Just uh, last week, uh, a school teacher was uh, accused uh, federally, I believe, for having a relationship with a 14 year old. Oh, like a female teacher? Yes. And she, she's, right, right. And, and she's pretty, by the way. Right. Right. It's good. That's why, I, that's why I didn't, people don't give me sexual agency or anyone at 14, because not always the best decisions that you'd make. And, and the only reason they, they knew about it was because apparently the, the boy, uh, he was uh, showing off to his friends, you know, like, that's, uh, that's how they caught on. And he didn't report it as a rape. He just, he was showing off about it in his, and some. Somebody else reported it. Yeah, like I'm in a Van Halen song, right? Yeah. Now, have you grown up there? A Puerto Rico, yeah, born and raised. And um, what are your thoughts about the the culture? Uh, personally, I don't. Well, I didn't have a. I, I don't. I don't think I have the best back background to describe it. I. Uh, uh, but. I think the most people are are pretty nice. I mean, if you'd, uh, I mean, if you ask for help in anywhere, people are some uh, people are willing to help you out. I think there's, and depending on where you go, there's a good sense of community. But uh, if you let yourself go just by the media, this place is horrible. <laughs> right. Um, what about the um, intelligence of? the people around you when you were growing up? Uh, I think the best way to describe it is uh, 
uh, I don't know. Since I was a kid, I felt like I've been surrounded by idiots. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's maybe it's my own problem, or uh, I, I I don't know. But I've always felt. No, st- statistically, it's not Dante. But but keep going, and and we'll get to the numbers in a sec. Yeah, but uh, um, but I don't know. I've always uh, from I don't know uh, from my parents told me our family. I've always been a bit unique. I got tested as an IQ. Apparently, I have an IQ of a uh, one fifty four. I don't know. Uh, that's good. So feel free to dumb it down for me, whatever you're talking about. Use some hand puppets, and that will be very helpful. Yeah, yeah. 154, that's, you know, I think the technical term for that in Greek is smoking. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm that smart, honestly, but uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm that smart, honestly. I've, I've made a lot of bad decisions in my life. Right. Well, you know, there's intelligence and then there's wisdom, right? I agree. According to my Dungeons and Dragons rule book, which, you know, is not, is what I base everything on. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, statistically, you are, um, you are quite correct that um, just here's, here's some numbers, um, if it helps. So there is a 30 studies that have been done on intelligence in Puerto Rico, or Puerto Rico Americans. Uh, the average IQ, would you like to, uh, would you like to take a swing? Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, an average of 85. Well, see, you have an IQ of what, 154? Apparently, yes. Yeah, see, now, if you had an IQ of 155, Dante, you wouldn't have been off by 0.3. See, you, you said 85, it's actually 84.7. So, now, the average has gone up a little bit, um, so the median IQ of 19 samples from the 1930s to the 1970s, 83.7. 83.7. The median, median IQ of 14 samples from the 1980s to 2000s is 87.4 now. So it's, you know, floating around the mid to medium high uh, 80s. And that's, well, that's bad. Yeah, I, I think I can, uh, I can speak from personal experience. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it in action. Uh, yeah, I, and I, sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I've worked, uh, I've worked as a teacher and a, and a part-time uh, university professor, and I don't. Uh, I'm hesitant to say it's a lack of intelligence. I'm gonna, I'm, uh, I'm gonna say that it's more of a, a lack of interest in learning, because. Uh, I like to think that when I tutored uh, some troubled youths, if you can call them that, I like to think I can, I've been able to get to them, you know, because by finding out what they're interested in. And I can, uh, I buy, I've actually bought them books on what they're interested in, whether it be something mechanical or, uh, yeah, like, uh, like that. I find something they're interested in. And I can see their, their eyes glowing, but then they go, they, they hate school. They hate their teachers. Like, nobody has asked them, what do you like? What do you want to do when you grow up? So they just get frustrated. Right, right. And um, have you uh, noticed, well, I mean, so I assume that there's quite a brain drain going on in Puerto Rico. Like, a lot of the smarter people are getting out, right? Uh, I can, I think one of the best examples about that is that English is a required uh course here like you and you take english here since you're in kindergarten basically yeah and um and you take it until your high school you take it when you go to college and i think only like 19 percent of puerto ricans speak english right according to gene simmons speaking english is quite important so you know if the guy from kiss says it <laughs> it's uh something to uh Something to think about. I just got some now, numbers in what? front of me, so I'll throw them out. The average annual yeah, migration of Puerto Ricans to the mainland United States in 1980 to 1990 was 13,000 annually. Um, and 1990 to 2000, it was 11,000 annually. And in 2010 to 2013, it is 49,000 annually. So lots of people are leaving Puerto Rico. Yes, and it's only going to get worse. Apparently, I I just uh, I saw a report in the news late, uh, recently that it's estimated that in this summer, 
approximately 100,000 are going to the mainland. That basically they're just waiting for their children to finish the school year. Right. And not many of them speak English. Excellent. Well, here are some more numbers. Why do Puerto Ricans move to mainland United States? Here's a survey. Household and family, 38%. Job related, 42%. Housing, 7%. Retired, 7%. Other, 6%. So it's all job related. It's all economic opportunity yes. related primarily. Yes. And uh, also, uh, and also in the in the local news, it was discussed how many of uh, of the uh, the ones that moved to the mainland, they actually end up in worse living conditions than when they were here, because many of the ones that are moving, uh, yes, many I do believe have many skills, uh, like doctors, uh, you know, uh, college graduates, but many also do not. They think that they can just go to the mainland, they're automatically going to find this awesome job and live the American dream. Well, in Puerto Rico, um, the interesting thing about Puerto Rico, and sorry to jump in here, but they have to adhere to the United States federal minimum wage standards. So mm, a yes. household of three can receive $1,734 per month on welfare compared to $1,159 um, on minimum wage. So huh. it, it pays to sit at home, collect welfare, as opposed to working. <laughs> I can I can I can also speak from that experience. I actually had a, a good business going. I I got frustrated. I closed it down. Now I live on welfare and I actually live better now. Yeah, without all that pesky getting up and going to work, right? Yeah, I, I still wake up at four, five in the morning just because I I I like learning, I like reading. Um, I still work. It just I don't report anything to the to the government. Right. Well, and Puerto Rico did have a bit of a fling with some free market reforms. Two thousand and nine, uh, new governor, new administration. Two thousand nine. Uh, uh, that was uh, 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 Fortunio. Yeah, so more than 20,000 public employees were laid off. Government spending was reduced by 10%. Ah, yes. Uh, La Lecia. Um Yeah, corporate tax rates were flattened and reduced. Uh, toll roads and the island's, island's biggest international airport were privatized. Yeah. And uh, so they tried to boost foreign investment <clears throat> by reducing almost to zero income taxes on returns yes. in real estate and passive income. Uh, so there was a um, basically some, some reforms. And, and, and how did that go? Uh, I, I I think it's a long story, but basically what happened was uh, I don't know if you uh, the 936 where the base uh, la, uh, laws 936 or propositions 936 I don't know exactly, but basically what they did is what they made uh, having businesses in Puerto Rico extremely profitable, and, and then that's when Puerto Rico became a pharmaceutical powerhouse where. Basically, everybody worked in pharmaceuticals. You graduate in chemistry or pharmaceuticals, you have a great job, you have a great living guaranteed. They took the, they eliminated those laws, the 936, and pharmaceutical companies started moving to Ecuador and Mexico, and a lot of people lost their jobs. So I think Fortunio, what he tried to do was uh, replace that lost revenue. But the problem was that, yeah, you laid off thousands of public employees trying to cut costs, but here's the thing, they still had a lot of expensive, I'm going to say non, not very functional private contracts, and the, the spending didn't stop in any way, they just, they fired a bunch of public employees, but they gave contract contracts to private enterprise, so where's the savings here? In fact, they actually started spending more. The, 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 the spending increased despite firing all those people. That's why so many people got mad. And they Well, I mean, there's usually lots of severance packages. You have to buy out people. And the, 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 the cost savings of moving from public to private sector employees shows up <laughs> in a while. And it's more expensive in the short run. Uh, because what happens is you have uh, more flexibility to fire people in the future if they're subcontracted out through private agencies. Plus, you're not directly responsible for massive pensions and uh, you can actually make them come to work, you know, like the amount of public holidays and days off and all that the government workers have. So it's like, you know, it's called a, a write down. Sometimes people call that a one time extraordinary cost in business. Uh, 
it is uh yeah it's more pain in the short run but it's you know it's better in the long run <clears throat> but basically these free market reforms didn't work out very long because people got really upset and just kind of went back to the nonsense right mm-hmm well, it's a little tough to call it a free market reform in one sense, considering looking at the numbers of private versus uh, government employees. Um, <laughs> you know where I, I'm, I'm going here, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna go on a limb and say I think Puerto Rico is pretty socialist. Okay, so for 2014, there was 673,000 private employees and 234,000 government employees. So a significant chunk is government employees. And that has yes. decreased somewhat, but it's also decreased uh, in a greater percentage from the private sector. <laughs> so the ratio of government employees to private employees has increased. Yeah. It's actually the public employees, they're, they're actually hiring right now. Well, it's election year, so yeah, they're obviously <laughs> going to hire. So, yeah, the government is like... Everybody depends on the government here. The government is uh, a deity. Right. And, of course, there aren't probably enough smart people out there yelling at the population to stop being stupid. I mean, that's kind of the job of smart people is to survey across the landscape, look at all the self-destructive policies that are drooled over by stupid people and say, stop, stop, stop it. You're you're destroying your future. You're destroying your children's future. You may think that it's fun right now, but you need to stop it. And you need very confident and intelligent people out there who are able to push back and to some degree shame or, or even um, uh, blame the uh, people who just want, you know, more government jobs. Like, no, this, we, we cannot have an entire island economy that, that relies on massive transfers from the federal government uh, of the United States. Like, we've got to actually make stuff, not just push paper around for no purpose at high wages. Yes. I, I think it was... Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think this proves a point you made in a video. I think it was questions for a libertarian from... Uh, I don't remember exactly. It was, it was one of those comedians of, like, they, they make fun of the news. Uh, I think it was John Stewart. 19 questions for a libertarian. And I think you made a point about how really smart people, they don't go into government, they go into finance and get rich. But in Puerto Rico, if you really want to get rich, you go to the government. Right, right, yeah. In, uh, in Puerto Rico, only 40% of the adult population is employed and looking for work. The rest are economically dormant, I guess, in your case, or working in the gray economy, maybe also your case as well. Now, yeah. it's it's pretty bad in the United States as well at 63%, but uh, that's still, uh, what, 50% uh, better than what's going on in Puerto Rico. I mean, it's brutal, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, too, many, uh, too, many people do what, too many people do what I do. I still work. I, I, I still work. I just don't report anything I do, and I still get uh, uh, welfare, which is called here los cupones, and people are referred to as cuponeros because they live off the government. I have... Uh, I have the government. Uh, I have a government health care. It covers all my costs. It's actually, uh, it's actually pretty passable, and the the way I get the attention I need, um, it's but it's in ruins. Basically, they just keep getting loan after loan. Uh, I don't know what else to say. I mean, the the, the well, so you know, Puerto Rico does. They they issue all these bonds, right? This is one of the big problems. Yes. Um, r ridiculously high yields, right? So general obligations bonds issued in 2014 had a yield of 8.7 percent. Yes, 8.7 percent, and you know they'll give you a foot rub and a happy ending. Yeah. Uh, this is compared to 10-year U.S. Treasury notes hovered around two and three percent, right? So uh, they put out these general obligation bonds with a massive yield, and also uh, interest payments are exempt from federal, state, and local income taxes in yes. all 50 states. It's a unique tax advantage. So they're exempting um, the yields from taxes, and they um, are, are putting out these massive returns, and that's retarded. I mean, I get that they get money in the here and now, but this is why, I mean, any, in any rational universe, Puerto Rico would have gone bankrupt and tits up uh, years ago, but um, it's not doesn't really have that flexibility, to put it mildly. So um, this is the usual, you know, central South American... Uh, garbage 
where the population gets lazy and complacent and state dependent and no one sounds the alarm bells because, I don't know, it's sunny out? Uh, who knows, right? Uh, and what happens is um, uh, people who may not be that inclined to a huge amount of intelligence to begin with get stupider and stupider because they don't even get up and 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 have the path of well if i study i'll I'll get ahead in my job and you just and, and then what happens is it becomes cool you know then working becomes a sucker's game and you know it's cool to just hang out and of course when there's a critical mass of people who are out of work or not working then it's not so bad you know like if you have a bunch of friends uh, and and family and all that I was just talking about this uh, dinner with my daughter. Like, so you, your friends and family, you win the lottery. And we're like, woohoo, I won the lottery. Uh, but if your friends and family all still have to work, well, what are you going to do? Everyone's working. And, but if you, it's the same thing too. If everyone on your block is working or everyone you know is working, being unemployed kind of sucks. But if lots of people are uh, unemployed, then the culture tends to adapt itself to that and make whatever a lot of people doing cool. Uh, you know, it's sort of like um, we had this guy on who um, uh, enjoyed uh, drugs and, you know, he'd made it cool, like a doorway to perception and so on. And, and this is to me the fundamental basis of addiction is the cool factor. You know, like I take this cool stuff and you're a square if you don't. And, you know, I sleep around and you're a prude if you don't. And I have drinks and you're a square and a party pooper. And, uh, you know, if you don't, you don't have any fun if you don't, right? And so the whole culture adapts to this. But human beings, <clears throat> we have these, these pulls, and these pulls are in two directions. And this is sort of foundational to society and, and our relationship to it, is that we want, we want to not work a lot of people, right? Especially people who aren't that intelligent, they usually don't have jobs that are that much fun. And so particularly less intelligent people, they don't want to work because work is not that much fun. You know, if you're a bus driver or a garbage man or a janitor, or, you know, these are, there's nothing wrong with these jobs, you know, but uh, nothing wrong with people who have them, but, you know, they're not a lot of fun. I, I worked a lot with a lot of people like that, and they didn't like their jobs. They came and did their jobs, and they didn't hugely complain about it, but, uh, you know, if they'd have won the lottery, they'd have been out there, uh, out of there. And so a lot of people don't want to work. But the problem is, if they end up not working, well, they get depressed. They get depressed because it's a long day to do nothing. It's a long day to do nothing. And I don't know if this is true just for sort of myself or, or the people that I know. But if you have no purpose in life... Don't you start to feel a bit useless, a bit like a useless eater, a, a consumer of resources and providing nothing to your society, to, to the world? I was, I remember reading an essay by Malcolm Gladwell talking about the people he grew up with and how smart a lot of them were. And I was pretty lucky, I would say, in talking more with people that a lot of the people that I grew up with, both in England and Canada, though more so in Canada than in England, uh, after I got out of uh, junior high, a really, really smart group of friends. Like they've all gone on to be like professors and, and uh, intellectuals of one kind or another. And we had great conversations. It was just a kind of cluster of brainitude. And I think that we were all pretty competitive. And, and the fact that we were all pretty smart and pretty verbal helped sharpen all of those skills all those many moons ago. And... The people in Puerto Rico, well, they they have a lot of welfare and they have a lot of free stuff and the government has a lot of debt and it's all completely unsustainable. And so what happens is you get the two things that I think are the, the most toxic combination of states in the human mind. One is depression and the other is anxiety. The two together are, I think, really paralyzing. Like if you're depressed, mm, okay, well, you can maybe turn that around. If you're anxious, well, it stimulates you to do stuff. But if you're depressed and anxious, I think that's really hard to uh, to turn around because you're, I think, sapped of just about every ounce of psychological energy, in my opinion. And 
I think that combination is tough. And I think this is happening to a lot of people in the West. You know, we know that we're on this utterly unsustainable course and we don't think that we have any power to change it. So we're depressed because our lives are pretty empty and we're just consuming without producing and we don't have any purpose larger than, I don't know what people do all day who have no jobs. I've never been in that situation. So I don't know what people do to wake up in the morning and you have your breakfast and you look at the 16 hours until you go back to bed and what do you do? Uh, I mean, so I don't know, but I think what happens is people feel depressed because their lives have no purpose and they feel anxious because they know it's unsustainable. Uh, and that creates a paralysis wherein they don't even swerve to avoid disaster. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I agree. And it's, uh, but to answer your question, uh, that you said you don't know what people do all day when they don't really have Help me, Dante. To do. What, do, what do you do all day? Um, I actually do work. <laughs> I just don't report all, any of my earnings to the government, and I, and I read. But um, in the general, the general population, before I, before I have uh, my, my uh, I like to call it the change. I, I like to think I started living when I was 25. Um, many people, what they do is uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, you know what the two pastimes of Puerto Rico is. Just to answer your question, in a just oh, yeah, in one... no, no. I want to, I want to talk about your life. Hang on, before we get to Puerto Rico as a whole, but bookmark that. Okay. So, you, how many hours a day do you spend working? I, 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 I'm a doc trainer, and I, and I work with computers. And I'm a tutor, and I'm also a professor. Okay, that's that's a bit of an n-dimensional resume, but all right. Um, and how much uh, how much of of your day does that take up on average, or during the week? Uh, my my day start. I wake up at four thirty in the morning, and I my day pretty much ends like at seven at seven at night. Right. I, I'm not looking for your awake and asleep habits. I'm I'm looking at how many hours a week do you spend working? Uh, every day, except Sunday. And Sunday, that's pretty much when I take to, I don't know, tend to the house, clean it. or. Okay, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why I'm not getting this across. How many hours a week do you spend? Not, not when do you wake up, not how many days a week. How many hours a week do you spend working? Uh, spend working hours a week. I'm going to go with a good uh, 40 to 60. Okay, so you're full, you're employed basically. Uh, I yes, but not in the legal sense. No, no, I understand that. You've said that a bunch of times. I get that. All right. So, you, so you have a job, and you you read because you're a tutor, and you tutor, and you are a professor, and you uh, are a dog trainer, and, and other things. But yes. what do other people do? You were saying that there are these um, two pastimes in Puerto Rico. Yes. <laughs> Soccer um, and child molesting? I don't know. What what do we got here? <laughs> I wish it was soccer. Um, no, the two pastimes. You know what the national sport is in Puerto Rico? I don't. Uh, politics. It's a, it's the national pastime here. Politics. Politics. I yes. would never have guessed that. What 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 do you mean? Well, uh, every show, like the most popular shows here, uh, you know, like local television, the most watched shows, uh, the most heard, and it's all politics. It's I mean, you think it'd be like cartoons or some sort of telenovela, or but no, it's uh, shows about they take they get these two senators from the opposing tribes, which is the los populares or los PNP, which basically the PNPs are the Republicans, the populares are basically uh, vote for us, you get free stuff, uh, you know, Democrats. Right. And and then you know they they put it they and they basically they have debates. Every day on national television, debates every day. You know, they just get two representatives or two senators, legislators, maybe the governor or the guy who's challenging him, and they have debates every day on television. And then the most popular show, which I which I believe is uh, Dando Candela, which is the same thing, just politics, politics every day. You go to the bar, people are talking politics. And it's like it's sickening. Well, I guess uh, if if you're all dependent upon the health of the state and the choices of politicians, I can see why that might be of interest to you. You know, the the yes. uh, the lion notices the movement of the yeah. uh, 
yeah, but, uh, of the tiger a lot more than vice versa, unless the tiger is hungry. Sorry, go on. Yeah, but the frustrating thing to me is that, you know, basically the only thing you have to do to win is be able to get the most free stuff. I'm talking about there's a, yeah, well, you, you even did a video about this, how basically the economy is non-existential, but it's election year and they're building a new park next to, close to my house. I, it, and it's pretty. It's, it's a beautiful park. They, re, they, re, that thing was untouched for the past three years. Now it's election year. They fix that thing up. It's beautiful. Right. Well, I guess people have time and they certainly have the inclination to follow it. But as far as mental health issues go, you know, there's, there's two things that Freud said are necessary for mental health. They're worth discussing. And number one is uh, love. And number two is productive work. I didn't get any of those when I, I didn't get any of those working up. The, the, growing up, growing up. Right, right. And and what is the state of the families in Puerto Rico that you've seen? <laughs> like, uh, like the like black people in in the U.S. So like, uh, seventy percent of moms are single. Well, it's the same IQ, right? Eight, eighty-five, eighty-seven, kind of thing, right? Yes. On average. So why why do you stay there? I mean, how how did the brain drain skip you over there, my friend? I'm a little confused. I have no I'd idea. I'd go nuts. I have no, no come idea. Come on, come on. No, oh, okay. you don't get that with you. Don't get. You may get that with other people. You don't get that with me. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm uh, I'm just trying to be humble, but I'm gonna go with my grand my 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 gramps. Yeah, he was a real inspiration to me. That is such a non-answer. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> And, uh, well, why, why do you stay? No, 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 I, mean, I, mean, I mean, he motivated. Well, my grandfather was inspiring. Oh, oh, he inspired oh the reason I'm staying? Oh, he's... that's easy. Uh, um, the reason I'm staying, I'm waiting for my wife to finish her master's degree. Then we're leaving. Because ed oh, ed okay. education is cheap here. Uh, education is very cheap here. It's basically, this is Bernie Sanders' paradise. College is free. Uh, Medicare, uh, you know, healthcare is free. Uh, you get free money. Even if you don't do anything all day. Well, you know, it's not free, right? I know. It's I mean, the free, American but, you know, taxpayers yeah. are paying for it, right? I mean, it, the, the welfare it, it, that you're collecting, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, welfare yeah. that you're collecting being paid for by the people, right? Yeah, but nobody cares. No, nobody cares, so it's free. No, but you're not everybody. You <laughs> I'm over here show, weeping, so, <laughs> thinking yeah, of my tell, tax tell bill. Me, tell, me how you, uh, tell me how you justify taking the welfare if you don't need it to survive. Um, no, there's no justifying it. I'll be honest and say there's no justifying. I was uh No, but you I must say a, something to yourself cuz you're uh, doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my uh, I'm going to call it my excuse. I had a business. I had a successful dog training business and um uh, I was I was making at least uh approximately uh 5,000 a 5,000 a month and I was working really hard. I woke up 5 in the morning, took care of dogs, and I stayed up and I had to travel around looking for clients going, you know, advertising, "Hey, I'm a dog trainer. Hey, you know, being an entrepreneur in that field, but taxes are so high, and you know, and you know, just in the electric bill and the water bill, because it, when you when you're gonna open a business, you get a different water bill, water and elect and utilities. Uh, utilities are more expensive if it's a business. But none of that is the fault of the American taxpayer, which whose money you're taking. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, long story short. Uh, uh, if I was making five thousand dollars a month, you know, sacrifices and working hard, and then I ended up seeing out of it like twelve hundred, because after expenses and taxes, so I got mad and I I, I got angry. Well, hang on, hang on. Uh -huh. Of that, of hang on, of that twelve hundred. Sorry, I guess of the thirty two hundred. Wait, thirty eight hundred that you lost. Yeah. How much of that was to taxes, and how much of that was to overhead? Taxes, I'm going to go uh, 60, uh, around 60%. Uh, 60% and utilities, just a water bill alone was $1,000. Your water bill for the dog training business was $1,000. Were you training yes. them to swim in a giant tank with Leonardo DiCaprio? Am, That's I wild. Am, I am not kidding. I, I, am, I am not kidding. I wish I was. I wish I was exaggerating. And many businesses, restaurants specifically, uh, uh, I have a friend that has a restaurant. He and he's and his water bill is twelve hundred a month. 
is is water very hard to get a hold of in Puerto Rico? I mean, I know it's surrounded by water, but not a drop to drink because it's also salty. But is it that hard to get there? No springs? Do there no rain? I mean, how does everything is run by the government public enterprises? That's yes. Okay. Every single thing. Artificial scarcity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just I have electricity like costs electricity in front of in me. South Africa. Well, electricity in Puerto Rico it costs uh, average retail price of electricity cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, stuff. Hold yourself. I know electricity. Uh, <laughs> A bit of a challenge. I, I should stop listening to this. I have terrible dreams about people leaving the lights on in Puerto Rico. It's 25 cents in Puerto Rico. The average for U.S. states is 9.84. And to put it in the context of a, an island, Hawaii is 34, but a place like Alaska, 16.3, Connecticut, 15.5, New York, 15.2. So it is an island, so it is going to cost a bit more, but at the same time, it's... Uh, it's all government public enterprises running it, so the costs are highly elevated, even in comparison to what it would cost on a free market island. So, and they shift it to businesses so that the costs are bundled in, and IQ eighty five people say, "Hey, look, the business are paying all the tax, and I'm paying none of it." Score. <laughs> and it and it gets even worse because uh, and it gets even worse because now that I, yeah, I live with the government. I'm uh, I live like basically I live with the government, and you know, in that way. Then they pay my electric bill. They no, pay come my on, utilities. man. You, you got to be frank about this. You live off the taxpayers. The government doesn't have a penny. You live yes. off the taxpayers, and you're also taking money from the next generation of Puerto Ricans because of these bonds, right? Yep. And you feel that is justified because you got taxed a lot? Uh, no, I'm not justified at all. I'm not going to make excuses about it. Well, you did talk about how much you were taxed. Oh, that's the reason I closed the business. I got frustrated, and then I did the math. It, it was actually an article in the newspaper, and then I looked into it a bit more. Where, hey, you can, you know, if I'm only I'm I working hard, and I make twelve hundred, but then if I stop working hard, and I can, if I stop working hard, I can actually, in a sense, make eighteen hundred. And it's no, I get that. Work. I get that. But this is this is this is a moral element to the calculation, right? It's not just dollars, right? Yeah. This is. It's not. I mean, because if if people make the choice just based on the dollars, then the system can't possibly work, right? I mean, it probably can't anyway. But this is one of the reasons why. Because for you, it's like, well, the government has this money. I can either take the money from the government or I can get up and work work for it. Yes. Right. So I guess you're helping to bring the system down <laughs> in a kind of way, right? Because yes. uh, by taking the money, you are uh, accelerating its uh, inevitable end, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I got... Okay. I, yeah, I got... I, uh, I, I tried. I, I tried for like two years i i actually i i tried for like two years to uh you know get people motivated you know I, I work at a college and i teach courses and i tried to get people motivated and stuff but then uh, i give up i honestly i gave i gave up trying no and, and the reason look, the, the this is this is one of the great challenges um which is that you gave up because there was a soft place to land called welfare. Yes. If there was no soft place to land, you'd have figured out how to add value until you just added value. You'd figure out how to make money until you just made enough money. You'd figure out how to be excellent at what you did to the point where it was worthwhile doing it for you. And this is one of the great challenges mm -hmm. of, um, of the welfare state. Yes. Is that it saps motivation even among the motivated smart people. Right, because uh, you are, um, you know, a young man, very smart. Uh, you could move to the U.S. or could have moved to the U.S. years ago and, and applied yourself that way, but you got stuck in this sticky socialist spider trap, right? Of good climate and free money, and you know, but uh, you know, I mean, if I'd sort of had when starting this show, well, I could just go on welfare. <laughs> really, I mean, I wouldn't have been grinding my gear so hard to try and uh, provide value. That's probably not a good way to put it, but I wouldn't have been working so feverishly hard to try and provide value 
and to really listen and and to challenge people and and continue to you know be in competition with all the other you know the 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 people's attention is like one worm and there are 10 billion baby bird beaks squawking away trying to get their attention so how do i get people to watch me well i have to keep figuring out how to add more and more and more value uh, and play the uh, current events versus historical events versus abstract philosophy versus practical philosophy versus the here and now versus the ancient past and it's a real juggle and i i enjoy that but that's because i don't have a plan b if you don't have a plan b you would be surprised, if not downright shocked, at everything you could achieve. But your intelligence is blunted because you've got the plan B called the welfare state. Yep. And so you can get up and read because uh, other people um, don't do that. Uh, Mike, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little tough to be on the other end of this line, Dante, <laughs> as someone who, you know, works... I think 12 sorry, hours is a light day. And, uh, you know, essentially when Paul Ryan's bailout that's not a bailout, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, goes through for Puerto Rico, uh, me and my children are going to be paying for you to sit home and read. Which, boy, I, I'd like to just sit back and read. That would be fun. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm I, I sincerely apologize. <laughs> so you apologize, but is that going to change your behavior moving forward? I mean, you're 28. If you got 154 IQ, you're capable of lots and lots of jobs. You can move to the U.S. tomorrow. And uh, uh, Yeah, as I said, I'm just waiting for my wife to finish uh, because the college is free here. I'm waiting for my wife to finish, and we are moving. Yes. So you apologize for using lots of resources that are coming from me and my children and my children's children, children. And you're, you just want to wait to finish using more resources so you can stop using the resources. And you're apologizing. Wait, wait, hang on. What is your, pretty, what pretty is much, your wife's, yeah. uh, what is your wife's uh, degree in? Uh, uh, medical technology. She's a... Uh, wait, is that a question? <laughs> I, I don't know how to say it in English. Okay. Uh, uh, but so uh, you work in the med medical field. Yeah, pa parasites. Sorry, what? Pa parasites, uh, pa para, uh, you know, parasites. You know, like she's studying, she's in a lab all day, basically studying parasites and how to fight them. Oh, I thought this was a joke about a mirror. Okay, I got it. I got it. All right. Um, so she's going to go and contribute to the healthcare fields in the United States. Is that right? Yes. Uh, she, she's pretty smart too. Yeah, no, I would assume so. All yeah. right. Well, I, I appreciate the update. I, I would say that uh, it seems unlikely that the behavior is going to change. No, not at uh, all. Because and not not yours, but the behavior of the island as a whole is not going to change, uh, and because it doesn't sound like there is um, anyone out there who cares enough about these poor people to tell them the truth, you know. And this is this is um, okay. you know, th th there's no politicians, and you're certainly not taking up the case, right? You're not uh, writing a blog or making YouTube videos or writing articles or taking the streets to the megaphone to help to help the poor people make better decisions and this to me is is the greatest cruelty and i don't mean you in particular but i mean just in, as a whole the greatest cruelty to the poor is not giving them the basic facts that in general they're unable to comprehend because they're usually not that smart right and and uh, finding a way to translate the wisdom of intelligence to the practical short-sightedness of the poor uh, and the less intelligent is, I think, a pretty foundational responsibility for intellectuals. Uh, and if intellectuals deny that responsibility, well, the poor will will take all of us down. And to help the poor, you have to tell them the truths that they're unable to uh, come, come to on their own, right? I mean, a, a poor person doesn't uh, have the, uh, let's say a less intelligent person doesn't have the skill set, the intelligence, and the ability to figure out whether smoking is bad for you or not. You know, that takes a lab, that takes double blind experiments and statistics and all that kind of stuff. But once that information is garnered, there's not much point publishing it in really complex peer reviewed journals with a whole bunch of molecular font cannon fired at the page, right? I mean, you have to put a picture of a diseased lung on the cigarette pack. You have to, uh, you have to, like that, that old, Picture, you know, the, the the little video, this is your brain, and then there's cutting the wires, this is your brain on drugs. Or when I was growing up, there were these um, wear your seatbelt things where people who had got awfully got mashed up in tiny short trips in a car uh, were just, you know. So you have to find some way of translating the disasters that are over the horizon to the short-sighted so that they can actually see them. 
And uh, that, of course, is what hell is about. Hell is a way of translating UPB to people who <laughs> can't follow the arguments that easily, the abstract arguments of UPB. And so finding a way to translate the oncoming disastrous to that which motivates the less intelligent uh, and the less able is foundational to intellectuals. Now, intellectuals have largely been severed from conversation with the world as a whole because they get snagged into academia and end up circle jerking to the next group of people who want to stay in academia. It's like ookie cookie with Latin. And that is uh, a real shame. And I'm, of course, I'm trying to break that mold by bringing direct philosophical conversations in a fairly easily understandable, if not digestible format to the average person. And we get lots of letters in from this show where people say, well, you know, I work on a plant. I never had any interest in philosophy. I listen to your show and during the day or when I'm at work or I'm driving and so on. And we've got a way of getting philosophy across to people as a whole, which is why we're cooking close to 200 million downloads. But um, Dante, if you want to be happier... <laughs> My argument would be uh, take your significantly off the charts, particularly for local conditions intellect, and help people, help people who can't themselves see this disaster that's coming. Uh, you know, you, your intellect might be a little bit better served avoiding the inevitable human disasters of low IQ, low intelligence, low fact people thinking in the, in the here and now and not noticing the canyon they're opening up in the future, it could be argued that your 154 IQ might be put to a slightly better use, helping avert the human catastrophe of low information voters destroying their futures than dog training. It's just my thought uh, that if you wanted to to uh, <laughs> mull that over, I think that would be a, an interesting approach. Uh, yeah. Help them. You happen to be very smart. Help these I, people. Uh, They're all walking blindfolded by low IQ towards the edge of a canyon, wherein there's a long, bloody, bumpy, stained with brains rock series all the way down. We've seen it happen so many times in history. Step in front of them, teach them, lead them back, help them avoid the disaster that comes unless smarter people intervene. Love people help people, and create the kind of world that you'll want to bring kids into. Uh, yeah, I, I tried, but I gave up, honestly. I tried making a blog. I Well, then I, your you know, brain but, is a yeah. waste. Your brain is a waste on your yeah. shoulders, man. What do you mean you tried and you gave up? Of course uh, you gave up. Yeah, I and of course you failed. Of course you failed. Yeah, yeah. Everyone fails all the time. So what? I think every single one of my videos is the story of your enslavement. No, everyone fails all the time. We, well, Mike and I kick around so many ideas for shows and we have to try and whittle it down to things we can actually achieve that we think people will be interested in, that we think will be of value to people. Who cares if you're failing? Well, I failed, so I gave up. Well, that's a waste. It's a waste. You have been genetically gifted with enormous intelligence. I'm not sure you have the right to fail. Because you know what happens if those of us who can understand what the short-term decisions of the future are and where they lead to, and we say nothing, are we not somewhat responsible for the disasters that ensue? And if you say, well, I tried and I failed, I don't, like, I've never understood that. You try again, and you try again. And you try again. I don't know, this thing that when I was a kid, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. If you fall off the horse, get right back up on the horse and try again. I don't, but I guess you've got this soft, sticky spider web of, of welfare to, to hang out in and do your reading and, and practice your dog whistles or whatever the hell's going on. But I don't know that you, if you have, you know, if, you're, if you have the fingers of Jesus and you are in a town of lepers and you can heal them with a touch, do you get to stay home and do finger knitting? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think you do. You've been you've been blessed accidentally, as have I, with extraordinary intelligence. And to me, that creates an obligation. Now, it, do, it doesn't really create an obligation in a totally free society, although it doesn't hurt to to help people out. But there are people, you know, if you if you see a kid playing like a, a two year old playing on the street where there's traffic, what do you do? What do you do? 
yeah, I've, I've, been, I've encountered. You go help the kid out of the traffic. Yeah. You go save the kid because the kid doesn't know that the big trucks are not friendly dinosaurs. Right? So before that kid gets squished into the tire tracks of an 18-wheeler, you go and you get that. And you say, well, I'm not obligated to. Okay. I guess technically, but man, there's a giant sky glacier of douchery landing on your head if you don't. And if you have the ability to do it, and great intelligence is great power. And with great power comes great, great responsibility. And with great responsibility comes deep obligations. And if you have the power to inform and enlighten the people around you, to save them from their own inabilities to understand the consequences of their actions, I think you have an obligation. I'm not saying you're evil if you don't, in the same way you're not evil if you don't step off your hammock to save the two-year-old on the street. But I have an opinion about you if you don't. Yeah, I, I can say that. Yeah, I, cut, I, I, cut the welfare, cut the welfare, stare into the abyss, and grow. All right, I'm going to move on to the next caller, but thank you very much. All right, take care. For uh, your chat. Take care. Take care.